The third financial statement that we're going to be learning in this module is the balance sheet. Now, again, we've learned about the balance sheet previously, but in a corporation, there's a few small changes. So, as a quick review, what does a balance sheet do? A balance sheet basically tracks the accounting equation and ensures that it stays in balance. So as a reminder, the accounting equation is assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. So the balance sheet is going to be looking at all three of these pieces of the accounting equation. There'll be a section for assets, section for liabilities, and a section for owner's equity. And then it's going to total them together to make sure that liabilities and owner's equity equals the assets. Now, just like with the income statement, corporations often have a multi-step balance sheet. So we're going to have a few extra steps built into it, but it's going to look very similar to what we've seen in uh, the sole proprietors that we learned about in our previous course. First of all, we're going to start with assets. Remember that assets are things that are owned by the corporation. Liabilities are things that are owed by the corporation. And your stockholder's equity is things that involve the owners or stockholders of the corporation. Now, the stockholders' equity section you'll learn is a lot smaller than the owners' equity section of the balance sheet we learned about with a sole proprietor. You're going to have capital stock, which replaces our capital account, and then instead of having net income and dividends in there, we are simply going to put the retained earnings account. And since the in the statement of retained earnings, we consolidated net income and dividends into the retained earnings number, we don't have to show those on the balance sheet anymore. So the stockholders equity section will only have the capital stock and retained earnings. That's one of the biggest differences you'll see in the multi-step balance sheet for a corporation. Now, just like with the income statement, we've got a header that begins the report. We start with the company's name and then the name of the report, which is balance sheet for this report. Then we list the date, and the balance sheet is the one report that's different from all the others. So all of the others have shown numbers over a period of time, so we have to list the period. So we would say things like, for the year ended, to tell them what period we're working with. A balance sheet is a snapshot of a single period of time, a single day. Um, so you don't have to list the period anymore, you're listing the single day that this snapshot takes place, and it always takes place the last day of the fiscal period. So we're just going to put the last day of the year. We're not going to say for the year ended or for the month ended. We're just going to say the date. And that's unique just to the balance sheet. So if we were to build the balance sheet's header, it would look like this. Your company, balance sheet, December 31st, 2020. Now, beginning the balance sheet, we begin with the assets on top. And we're actually going to be listing a subcategory of assets called current assets. This is part of that multi-step balance sheet. Current assets are any assets that are going to be held for less than a year. So anytime you see the word current, that always means less than one year. So these current assets are going to be any assets that will be used up in less than a year. We don't plan on holding on to them for longer than a year. Some good examples of current assets would include cash, accounts receivable, allowance for doubtful accounts, inventory supplies, and prepaids. These are all examples of the things that we will have for less than a year. So obviously we'll have some kind of cash um, moving on from year to year, but the cash we currently have is constantly changing hands, coming and going. Same thing with inventory and accounts receivable. We'll always have them, but the accounts receivables that we currently have, the stuff that customers currently owe us, will be paid back in less than a year. Our inventory, if we're doing our business right, should not be held on to for longer than a year. We should be selling it out and buying new. Same with supplies. We're going to use it up and buy new throughout the year. So these are all very temporary items. So because we'll hold them less than a year, they're all considered current assets. At the end of that section, we will total those current assets. Then you're going to have a section that's called fixed assets or property, plant, and equipment. Um, both of these terms, fixed assets or property, plant, and equipment, are synonymous. Some companies call them fixed assets, some call them property, plant, and equipment. Since we'll be looking at larger companies, uh, publicly traded companies as part of this course, um, they often use the term property, plant, and equipment, so we will too. But know that fixed assets is a synonymous term to that, and we used that one a lot when we were working with depreciation earlier in this course. So 
in the property plan and equipment section, you'll list out all of your different long term or fixed assets and then your accumulated depreciation at the bottom. Because accumulated depreciation is part of those long term assets. And then when you're finished, you will total all of your assets. So the total assets is simply your current assets plus your property, plant, and equipment, or fixed assets. So add those two sections together, that's your total assets. Now notice as we were going through these that we had a few contra accounts, allowance for doubtful accounts, and accumulated appreciation. Contra accounts on the balance sheet are always shown as negative numbers because they do subtract from the categories they belong to. So they're always listed as a negative number and are subtracted out of the balances. So now that we have our assets section built in, let's work on the next section. Next section is going to be liabilities. Just like assets, we're going to have current liabilities. Current liabilities are any debts that we plan to have paid back in less than a year. Some great examples of this include accounts payable and any of your other short-term payables. So insurance, income tax, payroll tax, these are things we hold on to for a few months and then pay them off. They're never held on for longer than a year. So these are all our current assets. So we'll write those all out and then total them. If you have any long-term loans, five-year loans, 10-year loans, 30-year loans, those are long-term assets. If you had lots of them, you could create a long-term loan or long-term liability category. For purposes of this course, we've always just had one account called loans. All by itself, it doesn't warrant having its own category. So we're just going to put that at the bottom of current liabilities. That is all of our liabilities, so we're going to total those. We'll take the current liabilities, add the loans, and that's our total liabilities. That doesn't match the assets yet because we haven't looked at stockholders' equity. So our next section is going to be stockholders' equity. Remember that stockholders' equity has only two sections or two accounts your capital stock and your retained earnings. So we'll put those together and add them. You get your total stockholders' equity. Then we're going to have a special line below that. Oh yeah, before I forget, retained earnings. This is why I add my arrows. The retained earnings right here comes from your statement of retained earnings. Remember, the retained earnings that shows up on the balance sheet is your ending retained earnings. The trial balance has your beginning retained earnings. So if you put that in here, it's not going to match your balance sheet won't tie. So don't use the trial balance retained earnings. Go to your statement of retained earnings that you built previously, get the ending retained earnings, and put it here. That's why we do the statement of retained earnings before the balance sheet. You can see there's a specific order that these financial statements are created in because each one builds off the other. We created the, the income statement, took the net income and put it in retained earnings, did the statement of retained earnings, took that retained earnings and put it in the balance sheet, we've built the balance sheet. So take the retained earnings from the statement of retained earnings, not from the trial balance, or your balance sheet will not balance. Now that we've got that, we can total the stockholders' equity and add that to liabilities. The liabilities and the stockholders' equity added together should, if you've done this right, equal the assets. If it does, you know that you've done your three financial statements correctly, and you're ready to move on. If this doesn't balance, then the balance sheet or one of the previous financial statements is out of balance and you need to go back and fix it. So the balance sheet is also the last one we do because it's our check to make sure that everything got done right. If this balances, we're good. If it doesn't, we've made some mistakes and we need to go back and fix it. Now that we've built our balance sheet, let's look at a few of the ratios that we can use to calculate and compare our balance sheet to previous periods or other companies. One of the ones that we learned about last semester was return on equity. Remember the return on equity is similar to return on sales. You've got the return or net income on something else, in this case, equity. So net income divided by equity tells us our return on equity. So we'll have to go back to the income statement and get the net income and divide that by stockholders equity. And if we use our example here, 11,951 divided by 27,151 would give us 44%. So that just tells us that for every dollar of equity that we put into the business, we get 44 cents of net income back out. So this means that roughly it will take us a little over the two years to make back any dollars of investments that we put in. That's not bad for business to put in money and get your full return back in two years. Is that great? 
We don't know. Again, we've got to compare this to something, compare it to a previous year, compare it to a different company to know whether it's good or bad, but that's the percent of return that we get from every dollar we put into the company. Now, another ratio that's similar to this one um, is going to be our debt to equity. So in this one, instead of looking at net income over equity, we're going to look at our debts over our equity. And what this is trying to do is just compare how much of our business, how much of our assets are financed by the owners and our retained earnings, and how much of it is financed by getting debt. So for this, we're going to take our total liabilities, in this case 150800 divided by our total equity, 27151 and that gives us 5.55. Now this one isn't listed as a percentage like our return ratios are. The return ratios are always listed as percentages. This one's not. What this tells us is for every dollar of equity, we have $5.50 worth of debt. That means that our company has, a, in this example, has a lot more debt, $5 of debt, five and a half dollars of debt for every dollar of equity. That's really high. We would say that this company is highly leveraged. Remember that term from previous semester. Leveraged means that you have more debt than equity. Uh, so this is a highly leveraged company. Is that bad? Generally speaking, having a ton of debt is bad, but to know whether it's really bad or not depends on you know, other companies in our industry and comparing ourselves to previous years. So we have to look at this in comparison to something to know whether this is bad, but it is high. We can definitely say that. We have a lot of debt in this particular company. So another question that often comes up when you have a, a company that has this much debt is just to look at it and say, okay, what if we had a sudden emergency? Not a big catastrophic emergency where we would have to just close the whole company down. That would be bad. But what if we just had a small short-term disaster? Do we have enough in reserves right now that we could pay off that, just our short-term debt? So to do that, we have another ratio known as a, a quick ratio. The quick ratio just wants to see can we pay off quickly our short-term debts? So to do that, we have to compare our current assets to our current liabilities. But when we do that, there are some current assets that just don't quite work for helping to pay off debt quickly. If we had a sudden short-term emergency, we could grab cash and pay off our debts. That we could do. We could even collect, put some pressure on our customers to collect from them quickly so we could use that cash to pay off our debts. Uh, but if we look at things like inventory or prepaid insurance, it's really hard for me to sell off my inventory when I have a short-term emergency to get cash to pay stuff off. Because if I if it's just a short-term emergency and I sell off all my inventory, I'll have nothing to stay in business with. So I don't want to do that. And it's really hard for me to go back to my vendors and get cash back from a prepaid expense. So those don't usually count in a quick ratio. So you're going to take your current assets, subtract out your inventory, subtract out your prepaid expenses, and that's the number we're going to use for the quick ratio. So in this example, um, we have our 81,951 in current assets, subtract the 44,300 of inventory and the $700 in prepaids, that gives us a total of 36,951. Those are the current assets we use for a quick ratio. So now if we take that number back, we take the current assets minus inventory minus prepaids, divide that by our all of our current liabilities, and that tells us how much we have in reserves of current assets that we can use to pay off our current liabilities. So we take that 36,951 number that we just calculated, divided that by 51,300 of current liabilities, and that tells us that for every dollar of current liabilities, we have 72 cents to pay it off. Now, it doesn't take a math genius to know that if you have less than a dollar of current assets for every dollar of current liabilities, we don't have enough to survive a, a short-term crisis without taking on more debt. 
that's not a good position to be in. So this is one of those ratios that you can usually compare or, or at least get a bead on without having to compare it to other companies or other um, periods of time. If you have a current or a quick ratio that's less than uh, one, that's usually a bad thing. If you have a quick ratio that's greater than one, that means that you have more cash available or more quick current assets available than short-term liabilities. And that's a good position to be in. That means if you have a, a short-term crisis, you could easily pay it off without having problems. So generally speaking, we want this to be above one. Now, that means that ours is bad because it's below one. How bad is it? That's where we'd have to go and compare ourselves to other companies. Maybe everyone in the industry is this way right now. And so we're not really any worse off than everyone else, but we could certainly improve in this area to try and get it above one. So that's the quick ratio. The quick ratio isn't always one that we use to compare to other people as much as we use to compare ourselves, just to know how prepared we are to handle short-term crises. So this is one that um, internal management will often look at to understand where they sit um, in the event of a short-term emergency and do they have a plan in place to be able to handle short-term debts should the needs, need arise. So in this case, we would either need to increase our cash reserves or decrease our amount of short-term liabilities to try and balance this back to a one or higher. So those are the three ratios that we're looking with at with the balance sheet. Uh, in conjunction with the two we learned with the income statement, those are five very core financial ratios that we can use to understand the health and growth of our company in comparison to other companies in our industry and over time.